I should intro. You know what? Never mind. I want to start like this. I want you to plug everything that you got going on now. I don't like to do it at the end. I like people to get their shine right now, like in the beginning. So what do you have going on? You're free the revolution. Do we also call you Adriano? My friends call me Adriano, um, but my artist name is Free the Revolution. And it happened very organically when I was just starting to sing on a regular basis to sharpen my tools as a musician. Um, I was doing a lot of open mics and one night I'm singing a song and in between I just just yell, free the revolution on the mic. And people yelled back, free the revolution. And then it became my tagline. Like I, I, I kept like performing and like I would say it. And then I started walking to different open mics and different places. And people would just start yelling free the Re revolution back to me. And I would just say it. And I felt something real about it. And uh, it just became my artist name um, all organically. And, and, and that is the purpose of my life, to free the revolution. Because no matter who you are, there's something that you're struggling with. There's something that you're fighting with in your life. And that is your revolution, and it's incarcerated, so you have to free that revolution. No matter what it is in your life, whether it's your mental health, whether it's not doing something you feel you're supposed to be doing in your life and being stuck in a job that you're not supposed to, or maybe you need to travel to a place that you've always wanted to go to, whatever it is, and you're holding yourself back, that revolution has to be freed, and you just got to get it. You know what I mean? I, I mean, I know for some people it might sound a little, um, you know, loopy or whatever, but like, this shit is real, you know? Well, that's the thing, right? Like, even as you say that, like, to some people it might sound loopy. It's like, who gives a shit? That's true. I don't give a like, fuck about what, yeah, what people that. think about those things because the over-the-top skeptic, over-the-top analytical person does just that. They overanalyze and, and they have a defeatist attitude that I believe they can afford. I can't afford to be a defeatist. I can't afford to be like, life is hard, so, you know, everything's by chance. Because if I thought like that, I'd still be in the hood, or I'd be in jail, um, or I'd be dead, yeah. you know, because that was the kind of world that I was born into, that I know you were born into. Unfortunately, because of our, you know, the color of our skin, we don't live in the normal experience um, that a lot of people do. I mean, there really isn't a normal experience, but we have a different experience. We because have, like, two. It's like you have one and then there's one that yeah. happens yeah. that we don't get to talk about a lot. Yeah, because people roll their eyes and they say, you know, are you sure, really? You know, and it's like, <laughs> it's so true. now we're at a place in history where there's no more time for being quiet. There's no more time for skepticism of our experiences. And even when people see, you know, what you see, you know, online, when you're seeing a man get killed in cold blood in front of everybody, there's still people that will try to justify that. Um, and they don't look at the humanity. And um, I don't have time to argue with, with those people. I just, I have to bring what I have, which is music and vibrations and bringing people together to celebrate life, love, and freedom. I, lo I love that you just said that because I've been deciding myself to do the same thing. I don't have time to argue with people. I don't have time for the back and forth, no. toxic exchanges toxic that, happen, exchanges, that happen on social media or even yeah. face to face. I just let my podcast, because that's my art. That's right. I just let it speak for itself. That's right, man. That's all you can really do is is uh, lead by example. You yeah. know what I mean? That's, yeah, that's the most important thing is to lead by example um, and remember that you have to follow your gut instinct. You have to follow that thing in your stomach that tells you which way to navigate. You have to follow that because when you go farther away from it, you feel a bigger emptiness in yourself or you get that anxiety you know when you're finally doing that thing in your stomach that tells you you really should be doing this and when you start applying that action like we're doing right now you feel right at home you feel like you're supposed to be doing this you know man that's yeah yeah it's it's so funny that you say that because i was just actually reading a post on facebook a friend of mine he just got into an accident like he almost died wow yeah they're saying he's like a centimeter that. centimeter from death he's good as long as he's alive i'm very very happy yeah. But yeah, he was close to it. And what he talked about in this post, he was like, I was doing something that was against my moral compass. Like, he's a salesman. He's like, I'd never sold anything I didn't believe in. And then mm -hmm. he started doing just that, yeah. selling something he didn't believe yeah, in. And yeah. then, bang, he almost dies. And it's so funny because I always find anytime I move huh. away from what I think I should be doing, what yeah. I know I should be doing, yeah. life just turns shitty. Yeah. It just starts going yeah. to shit. Little yeah, random right. things will just start going Absolutely. to shit. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because and as soon you, uh, as you focus in on what you're supposed to do, uh, all of a sudden... You're living in a movie. <laughs> like, wow, why is my life so epic? 
Um, <laughs> yeah, things unfold, um, and it's it really comes down to manifesting things, right? Like believing in something or feeling, getting an idea or feeling something. I don't know what these ethereal things that are in the, in the air as if they're not really mine or your ideas, but it's like they're already there and you just have the ability to kind of capture them, um, which is uh, an interview I saw with Jamie Foxx. Um, and, and that was the way he put it, and, and I agree with that. It's almost like you get to just pull these things or you get to tap into that um, vibration. And then when you then put the work in because there is no such thing as a big break or a lottery ticket whether you're a podcaster or a film filmographer or director or whether you're a musician whether you're a painter um there isn't a, a big lottery ticket moment like whether you're playing in front of 500 people or 5,000 people it's just momentum it's momentum it's momentum that you carry over to the next big thing and there's a million things that will always try to get between you and that next um, event or show or, or or way to connect with it. there's a million things that you will be able to use as an excuse Obstacle. to not get there um, and you have to make the decision to say am I going to allow those things to stop me from doing that the most important thing I have to do the meaning the purpose of my life or um, you know or am I going to fuck shit up you Man. know and you got to fuck shit up um, an example of that is last year, my older sister passed away from cancer. Wow. It was very sudden. She didn't tell any of us about it until she was on her deathbed, which was really shocking. I'm so sorry, man. Thank you. Um, and um, the day of her funeral was on a Friday, and the, um, it was November 1st, and it was October 31st that I had a huge show for Halloween which was my first show that I had backup dancers and choreographer. Um, it was it was it was something I was really looking forward to. And the day after, I had to bury my sister, and I had to make the conscious decision that um, this is what I do. This is the medium that I am, and music is a thing that brings people together. I always say that, and there are people in that crowd that are going through the same thing as me. So I have to be a martyr and I have to take on the responsibility on my shoulders, and still show up and spread love and spread positive vibrations and, and, and get people to celebrate life because they're going through the same thing as me and I just have to bite that bullet. Um, and I felt like that and I feel like that. Um, and it isn't about a selfishness of me going out there and trying to win a medal. It's about um, accepting the losses but also realizing that I'm not the only one that's going through something so hard and that that moment when somebody comes up to you and says, I really needed to hear that song today. Or I really needed it so badly. I was going to go home and God knows what I was going to do. But like, then I heard this sound and I came and people were there and there was a song that and I sang along with you. And it was just like, I really needed that. That for me is everything. You know what I mean? That, that's, that's the meaning of life, man. You know, love. Yeah, man. Even as you say that, it's like, yeah. Because I've had that experience so many times with music, yeah. countless times. Yeah. It's the most powerful medium. Yeah. And I've, I've also had people, like I said, like my growth has been very slow, yeah. but I've had people come and be like, hey, like I saw that video, mm -hmm. like they'll start talking to me about it. I'll be like, in my head, I'm like, well, I'm like, this person must have me confused with someone else. <laughs> <laughs> they can't possibly be thinking about me. Like, yeah, yeah. It's so weird to, to see. Yeah. yeah. The manifestation of your creation uh, coming to effect and connect with other people and then realizing that it really is much more than you. Like, for me, like, whether I, I, I come off as extremely confident, which I am, and, and, and a lot of people will think that's cocky, but they don't see the four hours a night that I do playing on my guitar or the rehearsals they don't see that and they don't also know or see the struggles or the places that I've come from and that the only way to get out of those places is to have extreme belief in yourself and to visualize where you're going and manifest it and make it happen consistently um, you just you have to believe in yourself and you have to make things happen and then you will see that the true people that really understand and connect with you they're gonna come to you and the people that no matter how much goodness you do they're still gonna have something to say negatively they're always gonna be there but you keep them outside you know you can't let those people interfere with creation and growth yeah. um, and connecting with true people and people that just have um, great intentions for the world yeah. but may not know exactly how they're gonna do it but that is there that intention is there and we have to help each other steer and navigate those waters of life you know yeah that's actually really well put great intentions 
because yeah. not everybody knows. Like I, I'm doing a bunch of stuff, but I even still feel like right now, right now I'm coming up to a project where I want to start focusing on like men and mm-hmm. helping men become better. Yeah. And it's like I don't, I don't even know where that's gonna lead. Maybe that's the thing I'm supposed to do. Yeah. I don't even know right now. Yeah. But I do have good intentions. That's the most important yeah. thing. I always said, um, I, I know people that say I don't care about people's intentions i care about their actions i ran into somebody like that once and i was like well that doesn't fucking make sense to me because if i step on someone's shoe and i didn't intend to and they tell me hey man you stepped on my shoe i'm gonna apologize and i'm gonna steer clear for making sure i don't do that again because my intention is is good if somebody smiles on my face and gives me a handshake but their intention is to fuck me over then it doesn't make any sense like you it's, it really is about intention you know because an intention is a person who's willing to apologize and to try to fix yeah. the situation and find the best way to do it the next time in a better way um so when you start your day with a specific intention and that intention is good um i think that's the first step to finding your process you know like colin's process yeah. there's the plug <laughs> <laughs> yeah man you're so that's so there's so much to you so so likewise you know you you know thank you but um so it seems like you made it about something that was much bigger than yourself like you brought up your sister Mm -hmm. and then you brought up the crowd and the people needing that and it's like almost like this big push is like you you've made it a much bigger mission than just you trying to get on and become something yeah um I think when I look into the eyes of all the great artists like Marvin Gaye, James Brown, Drake, The Weeknd, um, Donna Summers, Beyonce, I see myself in their eyes because I understand that they've never been chasing money and fame. What they've been chasing is their art and the production value of that art. And more than anything is to take that and work super, super hard to then give it to the people to share vibe, positive vibrations to the world. Bob Marley, um, and when you do that, the success is undeniable. It, it chases you. But most people that engage in, in you know, the industry, they want to be rich and famous. And so they're doing what everybody else is doing. And they don't make it because their intentions aren't pure. And um, right off of the bat, I knew that it was bigger than me. You know, I always felt that way. And I always felt that in life in general that I was, you know, that the purpose of my life was to do something bigger than myself. And I think that's why philanthropy is so important um especially as young black men like ourselves is so that we can open the doors to so many younger um not just black males but just younger people and inspire them and give them the opportunities so that they can continue to grow and become the best versions of of themselves and not you know drop out of high school and go to jail like so many of our brothers and sisters but especially guys you know what i mean that they fall into that deep circle of not knowing what life's purpose is and then you know, they just keep taking all the wrong turns. And, and, you know, the deeper you go into that rabbit hole, the harder it is to get out of it, you know? It's it's not just guys, right? But, like, Absolutely. when it happens with guys, mm-hmm. it's a, it's I think it's the pursuit of trying to become a man yeah. without having that man around to tell you. Yeah, man. To smack you in the head and say, Absolutely. not that way and not that way, you know? Absolutely. It's a weird thing where you're just trying to figure out how to become the most manly person and usually violence yeah and those wrong things yeah testosterone alpha miss fighting um you know the the rat race um and then also having a lot of bad um role models you know the kind of role models that are not um doing their phd in philosophy Mm. or you know or or great musicians who really are real musicians when you don't have those type of role models around or a father figure to show you what the options are and also when you keep seeing the news or the media or everything and you keep seeing, you know, yourself and other people and, and you see that they're not doing anything good, it, it really lowers the bar of, of the expectations of what you're capable of doing. But when you can finally learn who you are, learn how to love yourself, learn how to cultivate yourself, learn how to take a, a moment to breathe and to say, you know, I deserve better, but also how can I make a difference and how can I help? When you can start fighting those avenues in life and then making the the or taking the action and and making the conscious decision that you're going to do something great in life and not let anything or anyone get in the way of that and then be willing to fucking work your ass off like i always say i'd rather work and i said this in your documentary i'd rather work 
16, 18 hours a day for myself and eight hours for somebody else because that's who I am as an entrepreneur. But whoever you are and whatever it is you got to do, whether you're an athlete or you're working in a cubicle or you're doing HR, one thing you can't escape in life is you have to work very hard for what you want in life. You yeah. know? Hundred percent. That's an undeniability. You have to be willing to work your ass off. Hundred percent. I just want to move this real quick yeah. over here. But um, my next question to you is, how did you get this way? Who who instilled this in you? Because I know what I had to do, and not having a father around, mm -hmm. I had to find a lot of digital mentors and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. But like, what did you do to like? figure all this out. a big a for me huge was my my grandfather from my mother's side my mother's from ecuador and um her father my grandfather was basically my role model my father figure till i was you know in my teens uh and around that time when i really started to connect with my father even more than ever and my father and i became best friends it was just just really incredible um at being uh, just super charismatic and um and, and just um, an entrepreneur and just an awesome guy and I could call my dad all the time. So my dad was definitely a huge part of it too. My grandfather was very old school and very stoic and um, you know, he, he always said to me, you know, it, it, I don't care what you do, you gotta go to school, you gotta work. And, and he also used to tell me a lot, you know, you have a natural gift for arts. He's like, whether it's dancing or music, you have that. Um, but I was also an athlete um, all through school into high school. Um, and even in university, um, and I think that's playing sports really teaches you a very important lesson, which is failure. Sure. You need to learn how to fail in life over and over and over and over again. The biggest winners are the biggest failures because you're not scared to keep failing and getting up and finding a different way. You know, there's a quote about Thomas Edison. He can show you a thousand ways how not to light a, a light bulb, but one way to do it, right? Yeah, yeah. Or Michael Jordan, you know, I failed and failed. I failed so much time and that's the reason why I've won so much, right? Or I missed more shots than anybody else and that's the reason why I got more shots than everybody else. And like, yeah. you have to be willing to fail. And I think that athletic background was huge in pursuing, you know, music and becoming a musician full time. Um, even though in high school I won the talent show and, and I, you know, I, I always was in the arts. I, I played the Scarecrow in the Wizard of Oz in grade <laughs> eight and won the Dramatic Arts Award. And, um, and I always felt just like the easiest thing that came the most natural to me. Yeah. Um, as a kid, I, I, I mean, I think I've had like 43 jobs around that because I went from shoveling snow when I was 12 and knocking on neighbor's doors and being an entrepreneur to doing the newspaper to working in factories, working in cubicles, working in marketing sales, running companies. Um, working with all the biggest brands and, and um, for me it was always just I had the feeling in my stomach that I just had to be driven and also a natural leader and, and I just want to inspire people you know I really want to inspire wow wow I know I never thought of sports being that being able to show somebody that. absolutely yeah, of course you lose a game of course you're gonna lose a game you're gonna lose a bunch of games yeah it just makes sense and you keep playing yeah Wow, I yeah. never, because growing up, I never played sports. Oh, I, when okay, I was a kid, okay. I was 350 pounds. Like, what? Yeah, I was really, really fat. Holy shit. Huge. I, I just kept, like, it was around the time, like, I lost my dad. He, like, kind of disappeared, and I okay. just started gaining weight, uh, gaining yeah. weight, gaining weight. Yeah, I was a part of the um, the Open process. Energy. That's right. Open yeah, yeah, and, and falling into deep depression and, and all the things that you got to do. Because, like you, you know, we we lost our father almost around the same time from cancer. Um, I think you said your dad passed away 2016. Yeah. My dad was 2017. It was, it was a very hard loss. I spent three months with him in the, in the hospital. Um, and that was also a huge wake-up call of what my life's purpose was. And we're all going to die. It's the only thing that's 100% guaranteed in this life is that death is, is, is coming. Is coming, you know. Um, so what do you do before that? Do you play it safe and hide at work in a place you don't want to be or do you just fucking get it whatever it is you're passionate about just get it and there you're gonna keep running into a lot of people that say they're as passionate about you in the same avenue whether it's because you want to be a clothing designer and you're gonna meet so many people that always have excuses not to show up whether it's because they don't want to get you you can't they can't get paid or they can't um you know they can't find their 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 auxiliary plot whatever it is you have, if you're the real deal, you're going to find a way no matter what to show up. And showing up is not half of the battle, it's 90% of it, you know? 
I'm really starting to learn that. Like only now am I really, really like I've always kind of experimented with that. Yeah. But now I'm starting to like really learn it. Like even today, like I'm supposed to leave at twelve thirty to get over here. Mm-hmm. I, I always just because I know traffic, I know parking's a thing. Yeah. So I'm like giving myself an hour and a half, you know. Yeah. And uh, it was like twelve twenty five. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I should roll the joint. I'm like, he doesn't, because you don't know. You didn't mm-hmm. know that I was supposed to leave at 1230. I was yeah, supposed to be no. here at 2. You wouldn't know that. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, he doesn't know. I'm like, I can just leave at 1245. And then all of a sudden something came and said, but you know you're supposed to leave at 1230. Yeah. You know you're supposed no matter to matter what. You no. wrote it down. You didn't write it down for him. That's right. And he doesn't get fucked over if you don't leave at 1230. That's right. I'm like, it's only you. And then I was like, I just dropped everything. I'm like, I got to go. Bye. Yeah. I just left. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's, it's really... Self-accountability. Yeah. It's very important to hold yourself accountable to your actions and to what you, what your intentions are. Um, and don't bullshit, man, because we're the best at bullshitting ourselves in life, you know? Well, that yeah. was the only person that got screwed over in that whole thing, yeah. is me. That's right. It's just me not doing yeah. that. I lay those tracks inside my mind. I start giving myself the narrative that it's okay to fuck around on yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because we meet so many people. Majority of the people that you meet in this world, that in this industry that we're in, um, they're bullshitting. <laughs> you know, they're bullshitting. They're, they they just want to be rich and yeah. famous, so they're not willing to go through the process. And it really is all about the process. It's it's all about the doing thing. Um, I mean, that's what Joe Rogan was saying when it came to his success. It's not about um, you know chasing money and fame. It's about the process is just about creating and being in the moment and consistently doing and 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 being productive um, and doing it at the fullest of your abilities and really making sure that whatever you're doing that you love it um, and and that by far is the most important thing you know there's there's no better payoff than seeing the fruit of your label and the product that you create or the art that you create and the connections that you have with people the money and the fame is just it comes with it you know it's a byproduct. It's a byproduct, man. Exactly. And it's crazy. It's crazy, you know. Um, I've seen it in my life. Um, every single, after every show or after, just, it's just, it's consistent. For me, it's an inevitability that I'm on the come up, that I have, you know, massive amounts of fame and fortune that right now I'm going through the, the come up. I'm ascending right now as an artist, you know, and it's consistent that feeling is consistent because of, of all the people that are recognizing me or, um, you know, the social media or, you know, whether it's all the news outlets I end up or, or just the people that I meet and hang out with in the places that it's incredible. Um, yeah. And, um, but it's not for that. It's for the art. Those are just, like you said, byproducts. A hundred percent, man. Like, yeah. You know, um, th- there's that thing where like, if you chase the cat, you'll never catch it. But if you have the cat's food, the cat will come to you. you know? <laughs> I've thing. worked literally 50 jobs in my life. Same. Just going from job yeah. to job. The most uh, successful entrepreneurs are people that have had a gazillion jobs. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Same. Yeah. 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 So, um, <laughs> and I knew that because um, I've been a musician for two years. I knew that once I'd hit the two year mark that I was, you know, I, I had, I, you know, I had to work to get to the level where I knew once I was so undeniable and once I had, I was so established as a musician that I can make a very good living from it. You know, and I'm very fortunate. Um, but I also meet a lot of guys that when they hit that plateau where they can be uh, a full-time artist and make a real living doing it that's comfortable, that's their plateau. And that's cool, too. If that's what you want in life, um, you just need to know what you're doing. For me, it's to transcend globally like Bob Marley did, to have music that brings people together to celebrate their lives together, you know? But, but it wasn't always this. So, like, when you were working, mm-hmm. like, what brought about the change where you were like, I have to just focus on this? Um, so, even when I was, you know, wearing a suit every single day after work, I was, I was always connected with my fellow friends or musicians, and we were doing open mics all over the city of Toronto and, and other cities. So, like, music never, music was never not there. It was, oh, I, I, I mean, I even emceed wedding. Like, I emceed my, one of my best friend's wedding on, you know, um, I just always had this thing... Um, and, and even other events that I, I as a mark, I had a marketing company, or I still do, that I would put on events um, and I would MC them. And like I was always doing this, or I'd show up and people were looking for a singer and I'd just sing some songs and be like, dude, like you can fucking, like you're a really good singer. You should like pursue music full time. I'm like, no, no, no. It's like something I do for fun because like I don't want, it's not about being famous and rich. It's like music is, is just, it's the thing. But it was always naturally 
the thing that came easiest to me was was being on a stage, having a, a microphone in my hands. Always been there. Um, and even when I was working in, in the corporate setting, I mean, I continued to get leadership positions where I was in front of a big crowd of people, whether it was training them or, or, or showing them um, some new strategy. I was always in front of a lot of people and I was demanded or was able to demand, um, you know, people's attention. It was yeah. just always natural to me. So when I finally went full-time into music, um, it just came, it was just the most natural thing. And for me, it was, I was, I just quit uh, this corporate job that I had and, um, you know, as a VP and I just knew I was going to be an entrepreneur and I wasn't sure yet. So I, I finished performing at an open mic and the owner came up to me and, and offered me a gig and the money was pretty good, you know, yeah. and I was like, Eureka, you know, I'm like, this is your business, man. All the stuff that you've been trying to figure out in terms of marketing, media and all these events you've been putting on and ways to be an entrepreneur, it was always to get you ready for music. And now I have that business background and that drive, that focus, yeah. that that practice as a somebody who's worked remote location or marketing or delegating work to uh, employees of mine. Like I have that training, you know. I think if I did this 10 years ago, I'd be chewed out and spit out because there's a side of business that's so hard in music that if you don't have, if you're not prepared for that, you just can't make it. And it's, it. most people, they sprint and they die. Sprint and die. For me, it's, this is what I'm doing for the rest of my life, you know, and just continue to grow and grow and grow and grow. So it seems like you built a big part of your confidence, not just from the sports, but actually from working in these jobs, no yeah. matter how brief they would have been. Like, it seems like they gave you some kind of structure. Absolutely. the stru Yeah, the structure was the biggest thing that it gave me. It was um, the structure to be a professional, to be focused, and to make sure that when you're given certain tasks that you get them done, and also when you're dealt with problems right on the spot, um, that for a lot of people feel monumental, that you know how to deal with them, you know how to take a deep breath and consistently solve the problems, um, and and learning how to um, to work with a very big group of people and to be in charge of them and to be able to delegate and not micromanage because if you have to micromanage people that are um, very talented, then then that means that you either don't appreciate their talents or uh, you yourself aren't a good leader. You need to be able to let people do their own thing. And that's what production value for me is. So now in music, um, I really appreciate production value more than anything. You of course. Know? Of course. So, so yeah, it's always, you know, but it's, again, momentum. Yeah. Momentum, momentum. It was like I just kept doing all the right things. And then when I finally realized really what I am, which for me has been the most empowering thing, knowing who I really am. And the more I, I, I do music, the more I mean music, the more I, I just, the more I feel like I'm me, like I'm being the most truthful version of myself without any bullshit, without anything. Like in sales, there's a lot of bullshitting. In it, but the more I'm in music, it's so pure and truthful and honest. And there's no lying. There's no room for lying in it. So when you say that's who you really are, you mean music in general. Yeah. Like that. Yeah, has I'm, made you feel more yeah, like yourself. Than absolutely, anything. man. I'm a musician. Like this is what I am, and then it's a lifetime of pursuit of perfection, a lifetime. And I'm just very fortunate that I can do that. I like it. Yeah, man. Man, it's crazy. It's crazy just uh, talking to you more and like learning that kind of stuff. I appreciate it's it, man. Nuts. It's yeah. nuts because you've been through so much, and you like. We all have. Well, yeah, of course, of course. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm trying to take more stock of, like, the things that I've done in life. But yeah. I'm always in awe, which is why I love interviewing people of, like, what they go through. Yeah. To, because right now, as an artist, that's what I'm wrestling with. The mm -hmm. whole um, the whole making something bigger than myself. Yeah. Trying to find that thing that's bigger. And I think I've found it. Well, you're doing but, it right now, man, because you share the stories and conversations with people. Like I always say, conversation is currency. And time is the most valuable thing we have. Mm. So if you surround yourself with people that are not living their life to the fullest, you're trying to evolve consistently, the conversations are so low, and then you feel like you're in like a really shitty vibration. But if you surround yourself around people that inspire you, the conversations make you a better person, and, and you have to surround yourself around that energy all the time. 100%. 100%. It's very key. It's very key. So, like, now, how do you do that? How do you surround yourself with people who are only on the same vibe as you? Do you look for them? Have you asked I think university, people? think university, university was a big one for me. College and university, when I finally went to university at the age of 26, I was a high school dropout. I went to seven different high schools, but I was always um, 
good in terms of academics. Um, uh, and then, uh, so I came back and, um, and, and, you know, when I went to university, I really got to meet a lot of incredible human beings that I felt these guys are going to be my friends for life. And um, it was because they were just inspiring, not only in terms of their academics, but the way they live their life. And whether it's traveling, whether it's rock climbing, whether it's uh, music, it was just like finding other people that are just so inspiring who really live their life to the fullest that also have are very focused and har have a hardworking attitude, but smart hardworking. Because you can work your ass off in a factory, and I mean, they're essential workers, but at the same time, you're doing the same thing over and over and over again, doing something repetitive that doesn't really take much of your brain versus working really hard, but towards something that is um, strategic and, and, and allows you to continue to grow as a human being where you have to use your brain a lot. So I started surrounding myself with people like that. And then through music and through scenes and just through the things I've done, you know, you, you run into people and you have a conversation with somebody. And if you connect with them, then you got to continue to share those conversations, you know. Mm. you got to continue to open up those spaces. And I think it also, like trains you so that when you travel to other places the moment you meet certain people you get a vibration for them you just connect with them and you just have great conversation and you find out who they are and their story and you just like really vibe you know yeah. so that i think that's you know and you do that you have that you know the more you, you talk to the, to different people the more you really know how to navigate those conversations and those um different you know characters and you just start finding yourself being surrounded by a lot of cool human beings and then the network of those um, cool human beings just grows and grows and grows and it's cool true true it's it's like i said before with imposter syndrome i'm trying to get over it even when you when you put me in line with you i'm like nah this guy doesn't know nah, 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 i'm not like this absolutely guy. and you gotta like you have to <laughs> so you have funny. to embrace your inner kanye you have to embrace your inner um greatness you know yeah um it's very important you don't get to that level without that mentality you don't nobody who's done something great thought to themselves like well i hope it works out like it doesn't work that way <laughs> it, it, you really and if they do they're bullshitting yeah. they're just trying to sound humble because like people know how great you are and if but you, you know you have to have that mentality, but the hard work that goes behind it, and then if you even say you're great, they're mad at you. But if you say, I'm shitty or this, everybody's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. you can't admit how great you are, and everybody should admit how great they are. 100%. Um, and, and embrace themselves and their love, you know? Like, it's very, very important. I um, mean, it doesn't mean that you think you're better than anybody else, because if you did, then why would you be sacrificing everything so that you can share this to everybody else, you know? Um, but it's very easy to um, to judge people or to get a bad interpretation of people, you know? Yeah, I've gotten that. I've had, like, people who I, I considered friends, like, mm -hmm. messaging me about, like, the stuff I put out, saying how self-righteous I am and how, like, you should, you should like, you're not... Like, it's not you, it's humble. them. That's yeah, right. That's the humble thing is something I, I, I get out. And I think it's also been a, a huge thing with black. Black, confident men have gone it forever. Humble yourself. You need to humble yourself. They, like, we always fucking get that. But then, you know, like, Mayweather's super fucking cocky. Floyd Mayweather, I fucking hate Floyd Mayweather. He's so cocky. Conor McGregor's the best. He's doing the exact same thing. Wow. You know what I mean? So, um, <laughs> so when you're a black know. man, whether you're Muhammad Ali or Mike Tyson, like, they're always telling you to humble yourself. You know? Humble yourself. What's up with that? Why are you always trying to humble me? Bring it down. You're too up there. Bring it down. Fuck those guys. I don't give a fuck about them. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, yeah, it's true. You can't, right? Because even that conversation that I'm talking about right now, I let that derail me for months. Don't. Fuck those guys. And the, yeah, yeah, I had to actually like fuck build those that people, up. Man. And, like, why am I letting it's them. this person? It's them. And They're... from there, I just started deleting people. Delete those people, people, block them, and don't, don't even waste your time with them because you're out here doing something um, with the right intention. And anybody who sees anything else from that, it's coming from their own perspective. And when they start trying to bring you the toxic energy, get rid of them. Anybody who has toxic energy, like, you know, can't, you literally have to get them as far away as possible. You have to surround yourself with the utmost positivity and people who understand that life is short, but life is meaningful and, and, and that you have to take control of your life. Um, you, you can't surround yourself with human beings because then like, so what, you want me to just be unhappy like you and to just do this like like you're never going to make them happy no matter what you do so you have to keep striving for greatness and you have to keep doing what you're doing you know because yeah. um, if i let people like that stop me all the time from either performing or playing my guitar or for singing or for talking about the greatness 
um, of life, you know, like so many people like, you know, we think you're an asshole, you think you're this, like you need to like tone it down. Like it's always a toning it down um, thing. And, and it like, I, it's history proves like, especially if you're a black male, they fucking hate like John Jones, greatest light heavyweight MMA fighter of all time, never lost a single fight. And everybody's like, I don't like the guy, he's really cocky. Same guy will tell me Conor McGregor's fucking great. Yeah. Michael Venom Page, same thing. They hate how cocky he is. Always say that about black guys. Black, confident, great athletes or black, confident, outspoken men. Or, 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 or I love when they bring it back and they're like, well, they should be more like Martin Luther King. I'm like, really? <laughs> Killed him. Wow. What do you mean? Like, you didn't like him when he was talking in those days. So now you want to use him as an excuse. Like, you guys should be more like Martin Luther King. You fucking killed him. He got murdered. What are you talking about? Like, don't come here trying to use different examples of black figures that you want to, like, use as an example so we should be more humble. Because you didn't like him then, and you killed him. So don't, Malcolm X, you killed him. You know what I mean? Doesn't matter. Like, they... You got no time for fucking losers, you know, and loserdom and, 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 and people who are defeatist attitude. Like you sit in a board or at a table or a group with people and you tell them, this is what we're going to do. Nine out of ten of them are going to tell you 20 different ways it's not going to work out. Why the fuck are you here if you're going to tell me how it's not going to work out? You know what I mean? Like, we need to figure out how it's going to, why are you here? What is your value if you're going to tell me all the ways this can't happen? It bring doesn't solutions. bring solutions to the table. I already know how it can't happen, but it's going to happen no matter what, without you, with or without you. And, and eight of those people aren't going to show up because they're like, it's not going to happen. And I'm still fucking pulling it off. Then a lot of those people start messaging me. Hey, uh, can I come out to the, I don't got time for defeatist. You know what I mean? Because I can't <laughs> I afford it. it. You know what I mean? I can't I afford it. to be defeated. You know, the world's already trying to defeat me and you and, and you and everybody else. Don't let fucking defeatism or people that are defeatist get in your way, you know, because they've already accepted. They already bought it. And like, there's nothing I can do. Yeah, cool. You can figure that out and you can do that in your life. I can't afford to do that. You know what I mean? I can't afford to do that. I literally can't afford it. Can't, like, man. Like, like, right now I'm at a point, I myself, like, I'm at the point where I'm, I want to have kids. Yeah. I want to be a provider. I mm -hmm. like I want to do all these things yeah. that like a man's supposed to do and like I I literally can't afford it. I mm -hmm. can't afford to slow down and I'm starting to see that like I've had people try to slow me down but I mean the most in my life has been myself. And, yeah. and yeah, I'm Don't let that happen because if you really feel that and you have someone that you feel would be an incredible mother and a nurturer and um or an incredible partner or a person that will 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 give that child um a lot of love because I want to be all inclusive because there's people that are not uh, male, female, and they have children and they're incredible parents. And for me, it's all, the most important thing is love. If you really love your children, then you're going to be there for them. Are you willing to sacrifice for them? Are you willing to work hard for them? Um, sometimes you have to lose time not being able to see them because you, the, in the greater long scheme, you're doing it so you can have more time with them. But if you're not spending time with your children, you know, if you're not going out of your way in life to do that, like Kobe Bryant, an example. He's as busy as a human being can be, as famous as a human being, as rich as a human being can get. But he went out of his way to make sure that no matter what, he's going to take his daughters to school and he's going to pick up his daughters from school. He's going to make breakfast for them. He's going to spend that time with them every day. Then he's going to pick them up from school, come home, have dinner with them, hang out with them, and then he's going to go back to work. He made that happen. For me, that's the dream, being able to provide the time, not just the security, with my family, but it's to actually be there to take them to school every single day, to pick them up, to make them breakfast, to make them um, dinner, and to hang out with them, to take them to violin class or piano. Like, that's more important, but the only way I can do that is to continue to do what I'm doing now. You know, it's not gonna happen playing it safe or working, you know, some job that other people's expectations of me are, because at the end of the day, I can only listen to myself and I only know who and where I have to go, you know. There's no other way, you know. I can't live through other people's expectations. And um, you just got to love yourself. You have to love yourself and take time for yourself every day so that you can love those around you more. Um, and if you overanalyze and overcalculate, like, I want to have kids, but I can't afford it, there's going to be a point where you're going to regret it. There's never the perfect time because the moment you have them in your arms, that's when you realize this is the meaning of life. You know what I mean? True. That being said, children aren't for everyone. You know, you really have to know. But if you really want them, if you have someone, you know, that also wants them, and, you know, then, dude, they're the meaning of life. Because if we stop having children, there's no more humans. 
I, I think, like, you're just like, it's not for everybody. I do think that there is um, an evolutionary thing. Like, I Absolutely. think if a guy goes to 30 years old without yeah. having sex, yeah. I think there's something that's off, that will be off about that person in yeah. some kind of way. Yeah. And I think for the same thing with men, if you don't actually step into that provider, yeah. protector role, yeah. Yeah. as a father should, mm -hmm. I think if you don't step into that role eventually... I think something becomes off. Of I agree. Um, like I, I think, think that's needed. I absolutely. Think need that. I think especially um, coming from the backgrounds we come from as, as young black males who didn't have their fathers for, uh, you know, the majority of your childhood around the new generation of, of, of us, we have um, a huge responsibility to become fathers and to have a fatherhood as the defining component of who we are because we have all this love um that we want to give um to our own children and we want to have those children and we want to be good 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 men who provide for their family not just you know the security of money but our time and our structure and that for us is everything and there's zero reasons why you can continue to do what you're doing now as an artist and have your family there's zero reasons you structure your life differently yeah. around that you don't have to live a nine to five because we're not nine to fivers you know give me one second i gotta use the washroom do it do it Great, man. i'm all good don't even worry i got questions anyway i gotta look at these can you pause this yeah no no don't worry I just uh, oh oh yeah <laughs> i completely forgot <laughs> microphone well, actually i'll just take it off i'll just take it off yeah you can pop uh yeah it's just a clip you can pull that all good thank you also, is the air conditioning on or anything? You want me to put it lower? Yeah, if it's on, can you turn it off? That'd be perfect. So I'm actually going to not stop the podcast right now. I'm going to keep going. Just, uh, this is such an odd conversation because I really didn't know that he had all these different things about him. And uh, I don't know, man. I say it all the time, I guess I say it way too often, but sometimes you have conversations and it, it makes you not reevaluate, but it reassures you. It reassures you that you're doing the right thing. I don't know. It's just it's such a, a unique, unique person. And it's so funny because he is kind of like I am, where he's worked a bunch of different jobs and everything, but... You just never know what to expect when you talk to somebody. That's why I don't like researching people too heavily, because I like to figure it out. It makes my uh, intrigue authentic, and it makes my curiosity like more rampant. Like I haven't even touched my questions yet, and, and that's why I love doing stuff like this. I don't know if this will make it into the final podcast, but I felt like I had to say that, because that's been what's been on my mind the whole time he's been talking. Is like, I can't believe... I can't believe the work ethic. I'm just, I always feel like I'm really lazy. So when I see someone that has such a work ethic, I just kind of, I stand in awe. And I just want to know, I, I, you just, it's like what, anytime you see someone who's like mega famous or larger than life, you just want a piece of what they have. And that's what I saw with him, like that work ethic. I just want a piece of it. I just want to be able to get to that point. Sorry, I was just talking to myself here. Don't worry about it. Oh, man. All right, we're back. Back, back. Man, so, um, yeah. Let me get into some of these questions, man. All right, man. So, um, what is the street performing hustle like? What has that hustle been like for you? You started in May, you said? Well, you've been no. doing it for a while, but, like, you started to really push four times a week, you said? Yeah, so twice a week I'll perform by myself, and then twice a week with a band. Okay. Um, and I think the big is the big difference maker is having your full sound system. So I, I went and got a professional sound system that's also battery powered, so that allows me to throw on shows no matter where I am. Um, and um, it's been incredible. You know, it's been incredible, especially right now with COVID and everything that's been going on with Black Lives Matter and this crazy 2020 world that we're living in. There's <laughs> yeah. so many people that have just been locked in. There's so many suicide, such high alarming uh, rates of suicide and depression and, and uh, substance abuse. So I knew that there was going to be a need for people to hear something positive and to see something positive. And by me performing in a lot of different areas consistently, I've been able to connect with so many incredible human beings 
whether it was because you know they were re they really needed it um at, at someone else home and they've been depressed and alone and they come out and they leave their place to come into the streets and listen and stand there for two hours and connect with me or which is people that have a similar energy that are just always every day coming outside and they're bubbly and they're full of energy and they just want to be a part of the celebration. Um, it's been incredible, man. It's been incredible. I, I, I just, you know, I'm going to continue to do it um, because when all the venues close and when, you know, all the shows that I was booked for, whether it was, you know, weddings or festivals, you know, like many musicians ended, a lot, if not most musicians, haven't been performing live and, if you want to be a really good musician, the most important thing is to perform live. 100%. By far. Um, that's by far the most important element of music is to perform live and, you know, and practice. So, like, I'm going to just get sharper over this time um, by continuing to practice, by continuing to perform. But more than anything, it's just continuing to meet a lot of beautiful people. And for me, in my case, is to be in my city, in my hometown of Toronto that I was born and raised in. And um, to get to meet more and more beautiful human beings and to connect with them, it's, it's been a blessing, you know? So, like, COVID, the whole thing, that hasn't made anybody, like, standoffish towards you and what you're doing or anything Yeah, I like consistently that? meet a lot of people that not just, not, especially COVID, it's more like that are outwardly racist or, really? you know, what you call them Karens. They're always trying to shut me down or shut us down all the time. But it's like 1% because like there'll be 100 or 200 people on the streets dancing and singing and, you know, some lady comes up to me and starts trying to let me know that I, I can't be here and that she's either the board member of some condo or some, you know, faulty reason. And then a police officer shows up, puts $20 into the tip jar and starts dancing and singing and saying this is the best shit ever and like I really appreciate you guys are here. So like, you know, it's I can't let... People try to stop me. I mean, they try. And almost every single time that I start performing, somebody's going to come out and either swear at us or this or that. And then they're like, oh, you know, you guys can't be here. And then you have to make the decision and be like, oh, my God, like, am I not going to pull this off, guys? I guess we got we to gotta go, guys. Guess what, guys? The show's over. This lady right here said we can't be here. <laughs> and then I fucking tell her to get the fuck out of here. Black Lives Matter. <laughs> you know, I understand that you want to be an advocate. And we get it. We get it. But being out here making noise, I'm like, <laughs> yo, I can't believe. And then I fucking still do it. And then hundreds of people show up and dance and sing along and tell those people to fuck off. And I'm not gonna let anybody get in the way of this, you know. The time for letting people get away with shit is done. You know what I mean? For me, it was like, especially when I saw that video of George Floyd, like having his begging for his mother. And there's still motherfuckers that never said a single thing after they saw that. But two days later, they're fucking angry about the riots. I understand, I understand that people are mad and what that person did was, was unjustified and was a crime. I understand it, but you can't do it. <laughs> Why didn't you get that mad about seeing a human being be murdered and also to see that that's like, that is clearly what's been happening for so long. And you don't give a fuck about that. So for me, it's like you're either with us or against us. Like, if you have a different political view, I can have a conversation with you. I can even be friends with somebody who doesn't agree with me politically. I absolutely can, and I do have friends like that. Um, but if you don't stand with Black Lives Matter, fuck you. <laughs> you know I, what I mean? I stand with the sentiment of it. Like, absolutely. Um, I don't stand with, and I say this over and over again, I, we are not rioters. The rioters are other people who are trying to muddy our voices. It's about justice. I, th I think there's a whole, when it comes to that whole thing, I think there's a bunch of stuff going on. Because, like, yeah. Antifa is a real thing. That's right. Like, a lot of QAnon people. QAnon is a, is a real thing. Like, people keep trying to yeah. What happens is, is there's a bunch of black people yeah. who are upset. Yeah. And then these guys mix in with the crowd because they just yeah. look like, how can you tell a person, you know what I mean? You can't yeah. tell somebody from That's somebody right. else. Especially and, not with the masks. And exactly. And then all that nonsense happens, and then the black people get blamed. Yeah. That's what was happening. Which is easy to do. They were getting blamed. Their yeah. communities were the ones getting rioted in. Exactly. Not the nicer communities. Yeah. So it's like, 
there was a bunch of stuff going on with that. I didn't I didn't like how that was all happening. Yeah. Like I wish I wish that Black Lives Matter, if there was more of an orga- if it was more organized, yeah. I wish they could literally like step away yeah. from those people. Yeah. Hundred percent. That's what, absolutely what are not you, ours. What are you guys doing? Yeah. Why yeah. are you guys doing that? And you started seeing black people doing that in yeah. videos. Yeah. Yo, what are you doing? Stop! Yeah. I don't want you to do this. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And I love. And I've been that. an advocate about that too. You know, I'm like, listen, like, I believe in peace and order. You know. We're not just going to get rid of police officers. That's a stupid idea. We need to have peace and order. But the structure needs to be fixed because it's, there's so much injustice. You know what I mean? The structure has to be fixed. That's it absolutely has to be fixed. You know what I mean? Um, to think that all police officers are bad is the most ludicrous idea. That's no. Um, but there's a lot of pieces of shits out there. Um, there's a lot of people that only want to have power. Um, and they take advantage of that power. Um, you know, not just in America, all over the world. Um, and, um, but my first encounter with the cop was the cop telling me he's going to fuck me up yeah. and, uh, beat the shit out of me. Yeah. He better move motherfucker. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I dealt with, it, dude, was, all, it was my, yeah. it was my elementary school graduation that that happened. Yeah. Isn't that fucked so, up, dude? So that was my first encounter with police. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. So how is that not going to affect you know what I mean? I've had a police officer, like, 16 years old, walking from my job from No Frills at the time. You worked in No Frills? I worked in No Frills Yeah, man. Too. Dude, entrepreneurs, man. We've had a gazillion job. I've worked at Tim Hortons, all this <laughs> shit, dude. So, um, they fucking, um, one guy just comes out to me out of nowhere in the middle of the street, and he's just like, hey, man, where are you going right now? And I'm like, excuse me? He's like, where are you going? What's in your bag? And I'm like, and then out of nowhere, vans show up, and all these other guys come out, and they're undercover cops. I'm like, oh, and then they grab me. He's like, where are you going? I'm like, I just came from a work. He's like, don't fucking lie to me. Don't fucking lie to me. I'm like, I just came from work. And also, next thing you know, I'm handcuffed. I'm on the floor, um, you know, with my face being pushed into the concrete. They open up my bags. There's just books there. But then, boom, I have a box cutter. Why the fuck do you have a box cutter? Punch me in my stomach. Put a gun in my mouth. Um, you know, and then. Really? Yeah, man. And then. In uh, Canada? Yeah, man. In Toronto. And then, um, and I'm 16 years old. And then, um, you know, I'm. I'm, I'm you know, until they keep looking at my records, realize I'm not a fucking criminal. Then I'm like, dude, I wasn't lying. And they realize I'm telling the truth. And I'm like, the box cutters, because when you work at No Frills, you have to cut boxes all the time. I'm like, that's it, man. Like, you know, and then they like fucking give you your bag and kind of dust you off. And they're like, yeah, you're a solid guy. And then like, all right, man, have a good night. And like, or I've been arrested, um, you know, pulled over with friends, arrested and uh, put into jail overnight. Then released in the morning and be like, what did we do? Because we fit the description of some crime that was happening. But they're like, what did we do? Just go home. And like, I was in jail all night. And my mom's wondering where the fuck I am. And I'm like 17 years old. Like, tons of these situations, That's man. Tons. Like, wow. I can give you countless situations. I've, like, brothers been beat. Like, just tons and tons and tons. But That's crazy. But I still don't allow it to get in the way when I look at somebody in the eyes and I try to find a human being there. And, and majority of the times when I've dealt with police officers, it has been cordial and has been good and diplomatic. And I look at them and I'm like, especially coming from fathers that are military you know, I have a lot of respect for people in uniform, men and women in uniform. Um, I, there's so much honor. I was going to be in the military. I always felt a huge honor in it. Um, so when they see that, they, they see that I, I'm talking to them. I look at them in the eyes. I don't lie to both. Like, I don't need a bullshit police officer because it's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, you got nothing to hide. So for me, it's all about continuing to open that dialogue and to evolve the relationship um, within our community and theirs because that's the only way we're, we're going to get to the next level, you yeah. know? There's no other way. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. And, like, like, I had that. That was my first encounter with the police officer. Mm-hmm. And then my next one, like, I mean, my, my, my most recent one was, like, I was doing, like, 90 and a 60 going ooh, really fast. Ooh. And I got picked up by, like, an, a, a, a non, like, it was, like, a plain clothes, like, police officer. Yeah, and he yeah. pulled me over and everything. Yeah. And I was literally speeding because I'm like, and I told him, I'm like, I'm, my mom's a cleaner and she's cleaning right now mm-hmm. and I have to get over to where she is and I'm just late. And mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm just late. I had like, uh, just like a uh, green drink beside me, like the ones that you made just now. Yeah. And like, and that cop was just like, he's like, you know what? He's like, you, uh, he's like, I'm going to let you off. He's like, just get, get to your mom. Yeah. He's like, cause that's, he's like, he's a good, good man. Because he could see my age. He's like, I'm yeah. fucking not 17. I'm like 26. Yeah. He's like, get to your mom, man. Yeah. He's like, make sure. And went to the back of his cruiser and got mm. me a brochure and said, we need guys like you. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I, got a, I got a similar. I got caught smoking weed <laughs> behind a movie theater. 
<laughs> so I was just starting to get high before uh, um, I was going to watch this movie. And uh, next, you know, when I, I'm coming out of the, like, behind the trees, whatever, all these cruisers show up and they're like, you know, long story short, I, I mean, I give them my ID and I give them everything. And then they see at the time I was in university, they're like, wow, like you're going to U of T and like, et cetera, et cetera. The supervisor ends up giving me his card and saying like, we need to, we need to hire guys like yourself. I'm like, <laughs> and they pretty much like, let me know, like, you just got to, you're going to get like a $10 ticket for trespassing. That's it. And like, it's not going to go on your record. It's going to be just a fine, but you should definitely think about becoming a police officer. I was like, Wow. The cop you know? didn't even, he didn't give me a ticket for that reason. He's mm -hmm. like, if you want to become a cop, he's like, you can't have any tickets. He's like, so I'm not going to give you a ticket mm -hmm. today. Yeah, speeding like, ticket. Yeah, he's yeah, like, yeah, I'm going to give you this. Yeah. He's like, I'm not going to give you a ticket. He's yeah. like, but don't do this again. Yeah. He's like, you can't fuck around like this. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, wow, I'm like, thanks, man. Yeah. And that's not the first time I've been given like a brochure, but yeah. that was like the most recent time. Yeah, yeah. And those are the, those are the cool human beings that are out there that like, they're real, and, and, and that's the thing. You have to think about it. Like, the job in itself is just an anxiety attack 24-7. It's the crazy thing that they deal with. I couldn't, you know? I couldn't handle that job. Neither could I. I you know? That's that. the reason why I wouldn't become a police officer is because it's not a job for me. You know, it's like you really got to have the perfect personality for that. You have to be great at diffusing situations. You can't be some fucking asshole who just wants a gun and power because then you grab some guy, like, you know, this week, you grab a guy and you shoot him seven times in front of his children, um, which, of course, people are still going to try to justify. Um, but, you know, if it was a white guy, it would be all up in arms. But because it's, you know, black men, it's, well, he was a this and he was a that. And it's like, Who's this? Jacob Blake? Yeah. Is that is that who got shot seven times? Yeah, in the back. Okay. Yeah. yeah man, he was there's a video of it, too, man. It's fucking crazy. He was the one that was, like, about to reach into the car and then yeah, just, he got like, shot. unloaded? Yeah. Got they unloaded him. Yeah. yeah it's... And it's because his kids were in the car. And they're like, well, there was a knife at the back. He wasn't going for his knife, and the knife was found after re really dug under his car. Like the he, kids were in the car. car yeah, his three children oh, saw his father get murdered, and like well, they didn't alive, even like no? try to like arrest him. It was like they just grabbed him and pop, 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 pop. Isn't I he think alive? He's al oh, he's you're paralyzed. right. He's paralyzed. Yeah, which is arguably I don't even know what's worse. Seven shots in the back in front of your kids, like fuck. And there's so many black men that have been killed in front of their children, and it's see. This is the thing. I always think to myself. Oh man, should have just shot him in the ankle. You know, a shot anywhere will still they start wouldn't have the done person, it. Drop the person. I always think that, but I've never been in a situation That's right. where I got the gun drawn That's and right. I'm like this and oh. this guy. I've oh. never been in that thing. So well, I don't go out know. Of, you know, they go out of the way to save other people that have done horrific crimes. You know, like the fucking kid that walked away with an AR-15. Like he went there with the intention of shooting Black Lives Matter protesters, and they're fucking. Looking at him like he's a hero. Well, the thing, well, that kid, that, I, I don't like the fact that that one guy was rolling up on him with a fucking gad. Like, he literally had a gun like this mm -hmm. and was going to shoot that kid. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't, I don't like that. And that's mm -hmm. another, like, you just, you just said it, Black Lives Matter protesters. Mm -hmm. I don't think those people were all Black Lives yeah, Matter. Yeah, yeah. I think that white guy that had a gun yeah. that got his bicep blown apart, mm -hmm. I, I don't think, I don't know if he was Black Lives Matter, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I think he could have very well been Antifa. Well, they said what kind he... of protester arrives yeah. with a gun? True. Uh, like, Americans. Americans have guns true. a lot. Like, I've, every time I've been it's to the States, I'm shocked how many people have guns on them. It's normal um, for them, yeah. And, um, true. But, yeah, but the thing is, too, that kid went there with the intention, and they said that they started running after him. You couldn't see the video before, but he was there, like, with his gun to shoot at them. So that's why they ran at him immediately. What, what happened, what, well, the reason they were chasing him is because he already shot somebody. Oh, uh, yeah. They were trying to stop yeah, him. That's because right. Because they were like, yo, yeah. that guy just shot him. Yeah. But and then they went after him. But that is how, a, that's a fucking terrorist. It's just a, the whole thing is just, like, really, really. And they let him walk up. away. The cops were like, all right, man. Well, because he just kind of, he, the cops were like, someone's hurt over there. And he's like, yeah, over there. But and he's like, got an AR-15 on him, and they're like. But he's white, so it's okay, you know, because it's your right. But that's the thing. I think you're, I guess you're allowed to have an AR-15. Because, like, there were black guys that He was black up. with well, the rifle on his arms. Well, there was black people that showed up to some government building yeah. with a bunch of rifles. Yeah, so, open carry. Yeah, that's right. To sh let them know, like, you're not going to keep... Because a lot of the police officers have been absolute pieces of shit. So the know? thing is, you're allowed yeah. to have an AR-15 that's right. openly. I guess yeah. in some states. I don't know how it works. In some states, yeah, you're allowed to... Uh, Open carry. So maybe he was allowed to have that, so that's why they didn't question it. And maybe they didn't realize that he there's had a lot of shot somebody in the 100%, head. One hundred percent there's a lot of things going on. Um, but, but privilege is definitely a factor. Well, I don't I don't know. I don't I don't know that it's pri well hundred percent man. It's it's hard it's hard we, to we tell. We wanna say no, because, we wanna be Because you know? if they saw him do it, 
I don't think they would just be like, hey, go ahead, buddy. It was a if they same saw him kid, shot, shoot somebody in the yeah, head, Yeah, but the though, same, they're just same kid. He's black with an AR-15. That motherfucker's going to get tackled or shot. He's black. He has an AR-15. And he's walking, and he's 17. He's walking in front of the cops and goes, yeah, that guy. Like, Wait, what the fuck are you doing with this gun? That Come on, true. man. That is true. That is true. But I don't think that whole situation that happened was anything with privilege. Because I think the white guy that got shot in the head that started this whole thing, he, he was white. So it was a white-on-white -white crime that then spread into something else. And I might be wrong about that. But I remember there was a white guy like, shoot me, nigga. Shoot me, nigga. It was some white guy. He was just yeah, yelling that at people. Yeah. And then he got shot like oh. he requested. <laughs> he, did, he requested it several times. Yeah, who knows, man. But it's all fucked up. It's, it's just weird that any of that kind of stuff can happen. And that then, is happening right now, man. And then it just becomes about race. And it's not about... I don't know. Because race it, is a factor. It just is. Unfortunately, it race is. Race is definitely a factor. Yeah. But what's going on in the whole, in the whole scheme of things is yeah. just ridiculous. Yeah. People with AR-15s, people thinking that they can fight each other, people think that they see somebody get shot and that they can run up to them and shoot them. Yeah. Like, it's just a bunch of weird shit. It's just a big mess. Like, a protest should be a protest. And a yeah. riot should be a riot. Yeah. And, and, in my opinion... If you're gonna do either, yeah. you just have the balls to just do it. Yeah. Don't hide in don't hide in a protest, yeah. and don't do vice versa. Yeah. If you're gonna riot, just go riot. Yeah, well, just be like, yo, we're fucking this place up because you guys are bullshit. Yeah, and just go and do it. Yeah. But when you disguise yourself behind guys like you and me who are mm -hmm. in that crowd saying, yo, justice, peace, and then yeah. thinking of Malcolm and X and all that shit, you just wanna go shit, steal Nikes. You know? you know what I mean? Yeah. It's I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. There's like three degrees of people. It's like people who really feel the cause. Yeah. People who are just like there as like Antifa. And then yeah. people who are just there to steal to, Nikes. And that's shit. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's sad, man. It is. It's sad. It's really sad. Yeah, man. It's fucked up. But yeah, that kid shouldn't be uh, having an AR-15 yeah. at 17. Well, at 17, I had an ounce of weed, but that was about it. Nothing worse than that. <laughs> As in all the people that are in jail still to this day for having an ounce of weed in America. In America. I didn't even know that until they recently. They get the most weed. Insane. They get years. I yeah. had no idea. Some 20, 25. Some have had, got life. life. And it's like the back in the day, the strike thing. Like one, two, three strikes. Yeah. So like that could be your I think California strike. still has that, which is it's weird, man. insane. I, I mean, I, don't quote I, me on that. I love America, but like some things I look at and I'm like, oof. And it's made to... Keep specific people down. It was made at first to do that. And this and it's so funny. I said this in my last podcast. It's the way they're treating everybody is like everybody's black now. Like if you really look at it, like first we had Jim Crow yeah. and we would get arrested for loitering and put in jail and still like the equivalent of slavery. Mm -hmm. Now it's like they've opened that gate up to everybody. Mm -hmm. And now everybody can get it. Yeah, because with that. COVID... You can right? really be a Gestapo, right? And that's what's been happening. Like, what are you guys doing here? What's in that bottle? Blah, blah, blah. Like, they can really start telling you what to do, and that's very scary. That's what I mean, man. That's what yeah. I mean. It's getting weird, man. It's getting really weird. But um, let's move on. Let's move on. I, I guess we already... What's inspiring you? I want to go into that, because you seem to be a very self-motivated person. I know that you made a couple of things bigger than yourself, but what's inspiring you every day to go out and do this stuff? Besides the people who need it, what else gets you? Evolution. Evolution of what? Yourself? Myself and the people, the world. That, yeah. And love. Mm. A, prof a, a profundity of love. An endless well of love, but also an endless well of pain. You know, the shit that we all go through. And the best way to deal with it is to either do something very bad or to do something very good. But either way, you got to go all in. So for me, it's doing something good and working my ass off for that, you know, to fight the pain with something that only provides love. And it's very hard to do, but it has to be done. And if you don't do it, then you go the other way. And then you live in a, um, you know, a turmoil of self-pity, which, again, I can't afford to do that, man. I can't afford to feel sorry for myself or for anybody else. I have to empathize because I am an empathetic human being. I, I'm just an empath by nature. Mm -hmm. I think so are you. Um, and just- I uh, know that. Because you're here. Because this am. is what motivates you, right? Like you're motivated by doing something creative and to sharing it with the world. And that, there's, an, there's a layer of like being an empath. There's something there that you really see 
human beings are, as a cell, uh, as um, your fellow man or woman or person, and you really want to make a difference, and you want to make a, a positive impact, um, and that it, it's just it's in there, you know, it's a fire that you have in your stomach. I don't know if it's I think it's you know natural, and then you can feed that fire, you know, or you can douse the flame. So it's up to you. It's making that decision, you know, making that 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 uh, that conscious decision what you're gonna do with those feelings that you have, the love and the pain, and then making something out of it. Yeah, like what you say about fire, George Land, he was a, he was a doctor. He actually figured out through this rigorous testing of people for creativity, mm -hmm. he learned that um, creativity, it's actually something we're all born with, yeah. and it's the non-creative behavior that we learn. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I've seen uh, many studies that show children at specific ages how creative they are, and then as they go into this industrial school setting that has been created so that people are perfect at being workers in factories that hasn't evolved at all, um, then it, it, it squashes that creativity. At five years old, they score 90, 98%. At 10 years old, it goes down to 30 by the time they're 15 years old, it goes down to 12. And by the time they're adults, most people, it goes to 2%. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, that is crazy. That's, uh, that's nuts. It goes down to 2% uh, uh, from 98. Uh, Literally, if you don't use it, you lose it. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, and if you're put into a space where you have to get good grades, but those grades are the absolute opposite of being a creative human being. Yeah. You know? And that's why... In, like that's why you someone like you amazes me because it's like you're not at two percent you're not in terms of creativity you're way way but like it's just how, how did I, I know you probably don't know the answer but like how does somebody keep that creative fire going throughout all that stuff because we both went to school we both mm -hmm. had all the things that mm -hmm. put you down in terms of creativity that's right it's like how did it stay up it's really amazing to me sometimes um, I think, I think it's that. more than anything is being true to yourself and even when every single person tells you that what you're doing is wrong, including your own family, um, <laughs> you have to be true to yourself. And um, you have to follow, again, that feeling in your stomach, that gut instinct that you have. You have to keep pursuing that. Because um, nobody's going to believe in you when you're going through the struggle of figuring how you're going to get it done. Everybody's going to show up when you're already successful. And... Um, Fuck, Denzel Washington says that. Um, tons of great people say that. Sure. And you just got to be true to yourself and you have to keep going. Because, again, if you don't follow that thing in your stomach, then you know you're doing something wrong. You have to keep going that way. And um, the more you do that, the more fire it gets bigger and bigger and the confidence gets bigger and the belief gets bigger and the more momentum you have and you just keep going with it and you do that forever and ever and ever, you know? You just got to keep going. Yeah. Oh, man, this has been a great conversation for me. <laughs> yeah, same here, man. Same here. I really appreciate it, dude. Man, I really, I really appreciate this because, like, I didn't realize, you know, like, the universe always gives you mirrors. You yeah. Know? They're not just in your washroom and in your room. Yeah. It's the people you meet every day. They give you mirrors. And yeah. sometimes it's a mirror of what you could be. Sometimes it's a mirror of what you shouldn't be. Sometimes yeah. it's a mirror of what you need to hear. Yeah. But it's always a mirror. So, like, anytime, like... I, so I look at you like here and I'm here and I, I can see that maybe there's some mirroring and this is something that yeah, I you're up here, be. man. You got to keep going. <laughs> and you got to believe in that. You have exactly. to accept that. Exactly. You have to accept your greatness. You have to embrace your greatness. You have to embrace that you know that you're here to do something great. You have to. And that's a responsibility. Your greatness is a responsibility. Um, that's where you humble your... It, the humbleness comes in the responsibility factor, but you have to embrace the greatness. You have to. You have to embrace that you are great, but understand that that is a responsibility. You know what I mean? And another thing, like, you know, I read, and this is a book I'd like to share with you, The yeah, Alchemist. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, take that home with you, read it. You. It's very simple, but it also has, you know, that story about finding yourself and keeping true to the feeling you have about what the journey is in your life and that that will unfold um, that will unfold whatever it is that you're looking for which really isn't um, there is no plateau it's 
it just keeps going. You gotta keep going up. Like the moment that you have a, a, a that one final goal, like I'll give you an example as a musician. There's so many musicians that I met that their biggest goal is to be signed. Yes. By a record label, which is not my intention at all. I believe that now we live in the greatest era to be a musician, for you to own your own record label, to be independent, um, that you have the resources and the abilities to connect with the world more than ever. Yep. Um, so, and, and I don't want to work for anybody. Um, so um, they don't realize that 98% of bands or musicians that get signed don't actually do anything. There's no success. But when they get signed, so many of them are like, fuck, I finally got signed. That means I am legit. And then nothing happens. That thing that they really were searching for gets accomplished. And then that drive that got them there is gone, extinguished. That's the worst thing. That drive should never leave. You have to consistently put yourself in a situation where you're not comfortable and where you're constantly growing. And it has to be never end. It's a lifetime of pursuit of perfection and, and creativity and connecting with human beings. A lifetime. You know, a lifetime. So then, exactly what you're saying, this plateau that they hit, mm -hmm. this goes back to what I was saying about you making it bigger than yourself. Mm -hmm. So I guess they made it such a... I don't want to say small goal, but they made it something where once they get it, that's it. Yeah. Whereas if you make it bigger than yourself, yeah. once you get signed, it's like, well, I'm not done. There's still this so much more to do. just the beginning. Yeah. Like when you're prepared mentally for all the greatness that's coming and all the fame and accolades, when you already see it, um, like I remember I visualized myself singing in front of pi five people, then I visualized myself singing in front of 200 people, then I visualized myself singing in front of 5,000 people, like, and, then, and I'm there. I visualized myself singing in front of 50,000 people, which I'm not there yet, but I really, I'm there, I'm there, like, you know what I mean? Um, and visualize all of these, when you start meeting famous people that I've, I've had the honor and the pleasure to connect with and have these conversations, like really not just like, oh, I'm a fan, that, but really talk and, and hang out. Um, and learn and then share the, the the world and then realize like you literally are just like me five years ago and they're telling you they're like dude i used to sleep on this bench and now i'm here um they can talk to daniel caesar like when he's sleeping in benches in toronto and then a few years later he's winning a grammy for the r b album of the year you know that you just can't deny that and when you look at their eyes and they're like listen dude like i was doing what you were doing three years ago and this is what i kept doing and you see it like you just got to follow the process and the belief um and you just can't let anything get in the way of that or extinguish that especially yourself especially yeah. yourself yeah you can't and yeah. you have to realize this is a lifetime this is a lifetime pursuit and that we're blessed that we can do this we're so fortunate but we're responsible we're responsible to yeah. the people because the yeah. fame and the fortune, all that, it isn't that. It's the people. It's just the people taking it and sharing it with us and giving us this energy and this positivity. And, this, you know, that's what all it really is. Can you, you pull know? your microphone thing out? Oh, yeah. We'll sit it there. It's getting a little friction. Uh, man, I know you want to, uh, you want, you suggested that I open for you, but I think you should just open for yourself. You do like a motivational speech before you start, bro. Because <laughs> I was sick. Respect. And it's true, it's true. You're 100% right. I mean, Jordan Peterson talks about it. Like, like life is hard and, and unbearable at times, but the mm -hmm. beauty of it is that you're strong enough to handle it. Yeah. You're strong enough to get through it. And uh -huh. what you just said, your responsibility. Uh -huh. You have a responsibility to your greatness. That's right. You do. It's so true. And, like, it speaks to, like, because um, you've read Can't Hurt Me. It's a book by David Goggins. Yeah. And he has that whole thing where he talks about, like, being afraid of meeting God and God being, like, meet the guy that you could have been. Yeah. And, like, walk yeah. this person in there. And, yeah. like, oh, you're supposed to be this and Navy SEAL and this and that and this. Yeah. Like, I would hate to meet that person and, like, yeah. there's just this list of things yeah. that you could have done. Yeah. And you were just busy feeling sorry for yourself. That's right. Yeah. And I meet those people all the time that are busy feeling sorry for themselves. I look at them and dude, can't afford to do that shit. That I move away from. That I can't even handle. That's right. And, and, and also making sure you don't surround yourself around people like that because you can't save them from themselves. You, they got to be able to realize it. You know, I, mean, I mean, don't get me wrong. Mental health issues, are, it, it's so real. And people need to pursue professional help in any way they can 100%. in order to help yourself get out of those um, 
those, those ruts. Those ruts, that's yeah. right, those situations. And yeah. for some, it's something that can happen, um, you know, in a month. And others, it is a lifetime of a fight for them to make sure that their mind is in a place where they can love themselves and that they can live a life that is not stressful. I mean, they're always going to be stressful things happening, but, you know, you got to give yourself a fighting chance and you need to ha seek professional help. You need to seek... Um, you know, uh, uh, also have a sustainable lifestyle. If you're not sleeping well, if you're not eating well, if you're not exercising, you're not giving yourself a fighting chance. Um, yes. So you have to also make the conscious decision to get those things done. And I understand that those are things that are easier said than done, but you have to give yourself a fighting chance. Um, and um, and you have to have a good, a good support network, man. You, you know, you, there's things you cannot control, but the things you can control, you've got to go all the way in those things. You know? Yeah, man. Because you can't control everything. I know that. I can control everything, but I fucking can control my actions and how I'm going to do things. Yeah. And I'm going to show up and I'm going to fuck shit up every time. You know what I mean? Because we the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you know how to, like, tie it together and everything. Bro, yeah, you were, to come full circle, yeah. You must have been serious in the corporate world. I yeah. was, if I was a fun manager or something, you came in, I'd be so happy. Like, oh, this guy's gonna replace me. I'm gonna get to be <laughs> regional manager now. Oh man, respect, <laughs> respect, brother. Yeah. Man, um, oh, you know what? Let me replace this battery first, and then I'm gonna ask you the next question. Is that okay? Cool, man. Are you pressed for time? <laughs> so, all oh, right. All right, let's, you know what? Let's just go here. You know what? I want to go actually go here because we talked about you being a musician so much. I'd love to know your musical inspirations, your influences. Bob Marty, the first biggest one. I'm half Jamaican, and um, I think he's probably the most globally transcend transcendental musician, at least of the last hundred years, more than any other musician. I mean, there's, there's, I mean, Michael Jackson's the most famous, but Bob Marty is the guy that you go to Russia and people have dreadlocks, South America, people have dreadlocks, Africa, Asia, like people have dreadlocks because of him, smoke weed, and have this culture of love. Um, sure. More than any other artist, you know, the, more than any others in terms of that global transcendence. Like you have bands like the Beatles or, or, or Queen who are huge influences of mine and incredible musicians, but they didn't transcend to other cultures as much. Like if you go to South America or Africa, most people never really listen to Queen or, or the Beatles. But they know who Bob Marley is. Sure. Um, and uh, or they know who Michael Jackson is or Marvin Gaye. Like, um, I mean, there's definitely, for me, it's all about transcending globally and creating a, a sound that really brings people together from all over the world to create a beautiful, um, atmosphere of love and, and tolerance and respect, you know, that for me is, is huge. And I also, you know, being half Ecuadorian, Spanish was the first language I learned. And oh, really? Sing, yeah, so learning, wow. so, so learning Spanish music, singing um, Spanish music, um, you know, for me is huge because everybody loves Latin music. Everybody, it's me to dance, it's me to sing along. There's a sound about it that's undeniable. Afro beats, um, you know, R&B. But don't get me wrong. I mean, I sang the blues and old and blues taverns, um, rock and roll, pop, like everything. You know what I mean? I think it's important. A lot of jazz. You know, I performed with a, tra a jazz trio. Um, I performed with them for about a year. It was really awesome. I performed with an Italian band, um, with a guy on a mandolin and an accordion player. Because um, at the top of music, color doesn't matter. When it gets to the highest level, it's universal. It doesn't you know? It doesn't matter who you are. It's universal. I like that. I like that a lot. Cause that's yeah, yeah. I get that. Going for people who who transcend more Trans than anything. That's right. It's really good. I'm down to shoot that documentary. You have a lot good of, man. We good. have a lot of stuff. Good, in good, there. good. So we're working now. I love that. So oh, this is a question I haven't even touched on. So this drive, this mission. Do you ever find this stuff isolating at all? Yes, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's uh, I, it's almost as if you're a martyr. And I run into this. I, 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 I had the honor and pleasure to sing to Alessia Cara this summer. Wow. And um, she stopped and started singing with me. And she had her group. And all of them started dancing. And nobody even noticed who she was. And I look at her. I'm like, you know, I was supposed to open for you. And I'm on the mic, on the guitar. 
in between the riff, I, I look at it, and I'm like, I'm suppo- I was supposed to open for you this year, but COVID happened, so, you know, I obviously can't be one of the opening acts for someone of your level. I mean, Alessia Cara fucking sings the song to Moana. Like, yeah. she's as incredible human being, and I'm a huge fan of her, and she plays with guitar and sings, and, um, and um, I looked at it in her eyes, and I said, and I'm like, you know that thing that we have, like, as the real, like, the, like the artists of this world is like, you know, that fire, that ember that we have that is so undeniable, but it's also this huge responsibility because we're also very alone in it because we have to work our asses off to perfect our craft and then share it to the world. And we're alone a lot in that pursuit. You know, even though we have, we know a lot of people, we have very few friends, real friends, because um, we're giving so much of ourselves out to the universe that we need time by ourselves to incubate and to crystallize and in that pursuit, yes, there's a lot of, it's a big lonely world, you know? Mm-hmm. You have to accept that part in that. Um, you have to kind of take shots for everybody else. You know, I have to deal with the people that come out and be like, you fucking suck. I've had people throw water balloons at me from their, from their, uh, out from their um, balconies, water balloons. But in that same building, there's a father and his four-year-old daughter dancing. And then the mom sends me a video and says, I, I'm so glad you, ca- you guys came back. We love you. We love you so much. We want to support you. My daughter loves you so much. So people are throwing water balloons over there and screaming, you fucking suck, you fucking shit. And over here, there's a four-year-old daughter dancing with her father and waving at me and sending me uh, messages and videos of our performance as a band and letting us know that they love us and that we make a huge difference to their lives. So I have to take that piece of shit over there is hate. I have to take that shit right here so I can give them that love and I'm willing to take that over and over and over again. Um, there's a part in, in, in Bob Marley's documentary, which is one of the most, Marley came out I believe in 2012, one of the best documentaries ever made. And um, I think they were in um, Zambia or Mozambique. Don't quote me on that, it was, they went to uh, Africa and they're performing on this stage, I don't know, maybe 100,000 people or 50,000 people are in it, and it starts getting too crazy in riding, and not so much riding, but it's, the, it's becoming a mob. Yeah. So the police think it's a great idea to shoot gas into the crowds all over, and everybody starts running out of the stadium. The wailers get off of the stage. I mean, in the middle of the concert. They're all, everybody's giving off. People are leaving. Blah, everybody, there's tears coming out. No, it's like tear gas. It's the worst thing that you could do to somebody yeah. in a group. And um, in the interview, Bob Marty's wife says, we look back and in the whole stadium, there's only one person left and they're in the middle of the stage and they're dancing and they're on the microphone and they're just, even though there's tears coming out and there's not everything and there's every, you're in deep pain, you can't breathe, but you're still in there, you're still in there. And they go, fuck, we got to get back on that stage because that person right there is taking all of this for everybody. So they get back on that stage. And then he looks at them and he says, now I know who's really in the revolution with me. And they keep performing. And eventually the tear gas starts dissipating and everybody comes back and they celebrate. And that's, when I saw that, I'm like, that's me. I'm one of those. I'm one of that. I'm one of those. That's what I am. You know what I mean? Without a doubt, with an undeniability that that's what I am. I'm one of those. Because he's an inspiration, but there are many of us that are that thing. You know, many of us artists in whatever medium you are, that we're willing to die there at the top for everybody else, you know, and that's bigger than you. And, and, and the work that goes behind how much rehearsals, how many failures they had to do to get to that level where they're that good, you know? Yeah. Fuck. I almost cried. Teared up just now. Yeah, man, that's, that's what it is. That's what it is. That's what I, that's what I think when I see, like, Dave Chappelle. Yeah, that's what I think when I watch yeah. like a Stanley Kubrick movie. Yeah, oh yeah, I, like man. I just think I want to be one of those. You are, you are, you are, you are one of those. Now you have to put in the work to be at the same production level. Because what separates the greats and everybody else and amateurs is production. Is the value of the production? Do you have the best lighting? Do you have the best sound? Do you, when I have a stage. Did I hire a stage, a person who just design, a stage designer, a designer of stage, someone who's their life, as much as I'm putting time into creating music and performing music, all they do is create the best stages in the world. They're constantly inspired because now we're, now the show's going to be on a whole other level. So I have the best sound guy, 
the best sound people. Like, that's production value. Do I have the best videographers? What kind of video am I going to show? What are the angles? What's the lighting? What's the mazan scene? Who is this person who's directing it? Am I directing? Like, the production value and making sure that every single box is checked. That's a difference, you know? That's when you know, okay, this is where I'm going. If I'm going to do this, I'm all in. And if you have a plan B, you're done. If you have a plan B, you're done. There's no plan B. If you have something to fall back on, you're done. There cannot be a, a, a plan B, yeah, you know? I feel that. I definitely feel that. But yeah, the plan B thing is like, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard, especially when people bring it up to you. Like, I no. bought all this camera. I spent, like, $10,000 on all my Of course, cameras. man. I see all the gear. And then all of a sudden, my buddy's just like, yo, you better, like, make some money back from this. You just spent all this money. I'm like, yep. this is just so I can learn. This is exactly, man. I look at it like um, like a tuition fee. Yeah. Yeah. It was entry. Yeah. Now exactly. I'm, now I'm here. Yeah. And it's funny it's you say that, dude. I always said when I was starting in the open mic scene, and then when I... In that open mic scene, it was the best way for me to start finding all the best musicians who were playing regularly. Mm -hmm. And then those musicians would, because in, in the art scene, you always want to put the next person on. Like, that's why I constantly run into musicians. I'm like, listen, I'm going to be performing here. You can open for me. We're going to start at 7, 6 o'clock, show up and do a set. Show everybody who you are. And most of them don't end up showing up. It's fucking, it's, lets you know what they really are, that you're not all in. But the ones that show up, the point is so that you can get to the next level. And... You have to realize that you're at the beginning. So for me, the open mic in the first year, I was doing my undergrad. My second year, I, so I played in a, playing with a cover band versus me going and doing a solo thing. And a lot of the guys, oh, this, you can't fucking, uh, I'm like, I am a solo artist. I'm a singer. I'm a singer. I'm a creator. I'm a writer. You know, that's why a lot of bands always wanted me to be their front man, but I'm not going to be in somebody's fucking band. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a boss. I'm the, I run my own enterprise and I run my own destiny. I'm not going to work for anybody else. So it's my show. Um, and the, the bands that the people that perform with me understand that I let them know, Hey, this is my vision. This is my show. If you guys are cool, cool with being hard guns, this is what it is. I'm not starting a band, you know, whether it's James Brown or the I weekend, like, like that. that's, that's what it is. That's right? very commendable. That's so the second year of doing that for me was I'm doing my masters now, right now where I am, I'm doing my PhD. You know what I mean? And I said that to my friends who were doing their masters in architecture, who then now are, you know, professors or, and, I, and, and they see that. And I'm like, and when you look at the body of work from when I started to now, you see the, the catapult, like where, you know, but it's momentum. Yeah. You know, next year or whatever, when I'm doing, you know, the, the, the halftime show at the Super Bowl or whatever, like it's momentum. Yeah. It's momentum. And also, like, I'm not surprised when I get, to, like, um, Last year when I got to do Miss Universe Canada, like it was so big. But you it was perform momentum. there? Yes. Really? Yes. Like opening or how, how did that work? I was asked to perform for the swimwear edition. So when all of the contestants were in the swimwear, I came out with a full band. They were behind me. I came out and like did the dance. Everything performed in, in Spanish, reggaeton. Yeah, yeah. It was humongous. It was just an incredible show then um we came back to close the show so when all of the contestants were being called out there was a gentleman with a big bouquet of roses and all the contestants would come up to me and i was in a tuxedo now i, I changed and i would give them a rose and i serenaded them all wow yeah, man and after that like that took me to the next level word like boom please perform at our weddings people the casinos is where you now start making a livable income more than I was making working, you know, in some corporation. And, and, and even still, people would, were doubting me. They're like, I don't know, you know, I don't know. Like, then now I'm opening shows at casinos or at huge festivals. And people are like, yeah, I don't know. Like, yeah, I don't know. Like, they're still doing that. I'm like, how the fuck do you know? You've been working in the factory for 40 years. How do you, how can I take advice from you? <laughs> yeah, you, you know. You what? played it your way. And that's cool. Whether you liked doing that, because there's no shot in if you Whatever work you want to do, the most important thing is that you work. And I always say, like, whether you're a doctor or a janitor, don't ever hate on somebody for what they're doing because they're working. They're showing up and they're working and they're providing for their family or for themselves. You should never look down on a person. For me, it's I wasn't made to work on, uh, on, the, front, on, the, on the line, you know, or to be in a cubicle. I've done all those things. Like, and those things have, there's, there is an admiration of working with your hands, absolutely, and being a builder. Um, Absolutely, I have nothing but the utmost respect. I just know that it's not for me, yeah. you know. Yeah. And um, and I can't listen to people who are doing that, who believe that's the best for them, but they're trying to put that expectation on me. I'm not that, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, so I have to be true and real to myself, 
in order for me to continue to do the things that I've been doing that consistently yield these great events and these great moments and these incredible human beings that I get to uh, meet and come across in these rooms and these places and these conversations. And it keeps happening because I keep following my passion. And I follow that, but with a, a hard work ethic. You know, no matter what shit's going to happen. That being said, there also is a hard active recovery, taking care of my body, doing the yoga, going for a swim, um, and also constantly searching for inspiration um, in just living life. Like, sometimes you have to put the guitar down. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, you have to practice every day, but you also have to have the moments when I'm not going to take the guitar with me to the beach because... Um, I'm not going to bust there. I'm just going to put my feet in the sand and look at the water and just take a moment to breathe and to be thankful for the moment and um, find this inspiration in life. You have to. I mean, um, I was watching an interview with Drake and he said, you know, for the last album, like, he made, he didn't, sometimes he'd have three weeks in between recording a single song because he had to just live and be inspired, which is very important as an artist. Sometimes you have to just put your art down and go look for inspiration 100%. in the people and in the events and the conversations. You have to do that, 100%. but you always have to come back to the art because there's no such thing as a passive artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so true. You gotta like, yeah, yeah. I've had I've had that where you just gotta step back and kind of let the song. Well, in your case, let mm -hmm. the song kind of form in your yeah. head rather than playing and yeah. playing and playing. Absolutely. You gotta let that silence come and let something new form inside right. of that silence. I find that a lot with film as well. Like mm -hmm. sometimes it's like, I just have a bunch of stuff that I've just been like, what am I gonna do? Am I gonna mm -hmm. make a film? And sometimes it's just like, highlight it all, delete it all. Because mm -hmm. like now I, I need to just get inspired by something else. That's all right. this has been, that's it's right. too old, it's yeah, just yeah, yeah, that's sitting right. there. That's if right. I haven't done anything with it yeah. lately, yeah. get rid of it. Yeah. It's like an old shirt, you that's got right. out of the closet. For yeah, like you just gotta years. let it go. Yeah, and then all of a sudden something new comes. Yeah. I, and I did that recently, and that's where that documentary came from. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I was doing that. And yeah. like now, all of a sudden, I have this new vigor in my podcast. And like now, all of a sudden, it's, yeah. it's moving. And again. I told you, man, I'm like, I mean, I watched a lot of documentaries. I took a, a couple of film courses in university that have really shaped my ability to um, look at film and, and, and look at um, the creation of the people behind the camera and understand who's really doing something good, whether it's technically or whether it's inspirationally and who's just not. And the documentary made, I'm like, dude, like you're a real documentarian. Like you really know how to be behind the camera. I don't know what your schooling is or lack of schooling is, but you have it. Just keep going. You Thank have you. that it Thank factor. You. you know, you have it. I have no school. There's no schooling. And neither do I when it comes to music. You know what I mean? And I would run into so many people that have done years of schooling in music at the highest level and they can get on stage and they're real musicians, technically, and they're just incredible. And they go on and a lot of times they'll have an air of arrogance because like I went to this school and did that. Oh, no, I, oh, can I sing? I've said, and I'm like, okay. And then they can go on. And then after they're done, I'm going to look at them and I'm going to say, that was great watch what I'm going to do now. And every fucking person <laughs> in the room is going to react in a different way. Because you can be an incredible technician, but if the baseline is like this, mm. okay. But then you have somebody who didn't do the schooling that you did, but they're going to go. Yeah. Same with James Brown. He didn't go to school for music, but he's James Brown. And most of the people that are the greatest artists of all time didn't go to school. Yeah. But they went to the school of hard knocks. Because I'm going to learn from the people that did go to school how to actually practice correctly. Yeah. And I have so much admiration and respect for those people who have done it, who have gone to school for it, who are true artists, um, but sometimes get lost in the... The rules. The rules. That's what I find. And they become pedantic, and they lose the rawness of art. You have to be able to keep the rawness and then put it in a... It, it, be technical with it, but the yeah. most important thing is the fire, is the rawness. You know what I mean? And what it does to the person that's being confronted by it. How that art, that medium, how it makes people feel. That's the most important thing. Not about your fucking ego, about how great and what school you went to and this and that. And then it doesn't really, what's going on here? You know, like, you're not really doing anything to this room. Like, yeah, you can do this and that, but you're playing baseline music and, yeah. or conversational background music, but you're not doing something to the people. You're not moving them, yeah. And you got to move that meter, you know? I I've, I've, it's so funny you say that because I've had that. I remember when I was selling, it's actually this thing. 
I actually had to buy rebuy this. Mm -hmm. I actually sold it once, mm -hmm. and I'm selling it to these guys on Kijiji, mm -hmm. and they're telling me about how they do like their video. Yeah. And they, these guys have gone to film school, and I'm like, yeah. hey, I'm um, like a much easier way that I do it. I go, I'm like, I sync up, I use this program, I sync it this way, I do this, I do mm -hmm. this, and they're like, never thought about that. They're like. I'm like, yeah, that would cut like probably two hours off of your like yeah. workflow. Like that's how you should do it. Mm -hmm. They're like, did you go to school? I'm like, no. I'm like, mm -hmm. this is how I do but it. But you researched all the information, which is accessible universally now to every information is so accessible. Um, audiobooks, like I have every audiobook on the business of music, which most creative or musicians don't study. Really? You know, or don't want to deal with. But knowing the business is so key. Um, and establishing that that blueprint down and having my managers have, having my lawyers um, and understanding what the overall big picture is for me is huge and um, there's um, you know then there's there's hands-on experience there's learning things on the ground that you can't learn in school you know you just you can't you have to apply those things once you're there and if you're a person who really is, is passionate and is focused, you're going to find out all the, the ways to get things done on the ground that you may not necessarily find at school. Um, that being said too, um, there's things in school that you just, you're not gonna learn on the streets that you need to learn. Um, and you can find those things through books, through, through people that have gone to school, yeah. friends or, or colleagues within the industry. But um, I mean, ironically, mo like you see a lot of people who are either musicians, actors, painters that get honorary degrees and then they're the ones that are teaching a whole school yeah. of people um, about the industry but they didn't go to school for it. Yeah. But they're masters of the industry. 100%. And that is, again, the school of hard knocks, you know? 100%. Like, Jay-Z didn't go to school for economics but... That's what I was going to say. Economic genius. Like, if there was, like, an economic, like, he's the utmost or you can learn from Jay-Z, I'd be like, yeah, I'm going to do the, the Jay-Z course. I'm Khan is a billionaire, right? Or, right. Um, I don't know. There's, uh, there's so many. There's, there's so a lot. Many. You know, Zuckerberg, although Zuckerberg was already in Harvard, so. He's already in Harvard, yeah. But, yeah he's, but he definitely stepped away in, in a big way. That's right. You know? Yeah. Definitely moved the world. Man. So, I mean, you got to be somewhere in half an hour. So, I'm just going to hit you with the last question. Because, honestly, we've gone through everything without even me really realizing it. Mm -hmm. Which is usually what happens with a good conversation. Yeah. Um, my last thing to you would be best advice for anybody who is an artist and wants to get out there but is just kind of scared mm -hmm. um, and doesn't know the best way to go about getting started and, you know? Um, um, watch a lot of documentaries of people that inspire you and listen to their stories of how they began and listen to their stories of when they always say, if I can do it, so can you. They really mean that. Yes. Um, also, whatever it is that you're passionate about, find any way every day or on a consistent weekly basis and then try to make it, if it's only once a week, then twice a week, to be around that medium, whether it's, if you're a musician, go to open mics. If you're too scared to sing at an open mic, practice one song solidly for a week, for a month, I mean solidly, then get to the open mic and do it. You cannot really get it. You, you can't pursue something until you actually start doing it. You have to start doing it, and you've got to be scared. Every single time I'm about to perform, I have butterflies in my stomach, no matter what. Every single time. <laughs> Whether I'm going to sing by myself, like, I always have butterflies. When I'm about to perform in front of people, I always have butterflies in my stomach. That's good. That fear is good for you. You have to have that thing. That means you care. Um, but you got to put yourself out there and you really need to start finding the rooms and places where you find those people that do the same things you do so you can start being around them and start. And if you want to be a videographer, maybe you can find somebody who needs somebody to be an assistant. Go do that and do it for free. Do you know why? Because the payment, what you're paying for is the lessons. If you immediately want to start making money off of what a craft you're in it for the wrong reasons, man. You need to be an apprentice of life and of your craft. You have to because you're literally investing in making yourself better at that thing. Don't be that guy who started making beats and one year later or a few months later thinks he, he's entitled to making money from people. Get good at working with other artists. 
Get good at that first. You know, you're not entitled to making money. If you look at all the best of the best of the best, they did not make money for years until they started, until, until they got to a level that was so undeniable that it just came to them. But if you pursue the money, the riches and the fame and the accolades, you're not going to make it. And if you do, it's not going to last. It's not going to be sustainable because people go up and down all the time. If you want to do this for the rest of your life, you have to invest into the long game. You have to. You have to invest into the long game. And you have to believe in yourself. And you got to take care of yourself. And But you just, you have to be constantly around that thing. Whatever that medium is, you have to constantly be learning about it. YouTube it. Books. Um, getting those things. Saving up to get that first guitar or that first microphone or the first camera. And then searching every way to, to, to get better at using it. Constantly grab that tool and learn how to make it. Make your, make your art or your 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 creation better constantly and it's a lifetime of pursuit of perfection you never become a master you just constantly have to keep trying to grow you know man that's perfect man uh well thank you so much for having me at your place my thank pleasure you. man thanks for coming through yeah no problem to uh, the artist's hub yeah that's what this is yeah, and man. uh thank you for telling me about those documentaries thank you for lending me this this is the alchemist this mm -hmm. is amazing i gotta read this and um yeah, just thank you so much for putting out your music. Thank you so much for being there Respect. during that documentary Respect. because like you you were actually a part like a catalyst in that documentary. I was like, where can I put him? Every time Respect. I was thinking of like segments, I was like, where can I put him? Huh. Because you were like a, a, a fun part of that. And uh, yeah, thank you for giving me such kind words and uh, for inspiring me because this is 100% been over the top inspiring for me i've been listening to david goggins all mm -hmm. week good and he's an inspiring absolutely motherfucker, yeah and this was way more inspiring for me yeah respect man way more inspiring thank so you man. thank you so much well, we gotta work on the documentary yeah we're gonna do stuff together 100 yeah. yeah. all right guys peace respect free the revolution free the revolution <laughs>